Hi, everyone. This is Scott McLeod. Welcome to another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I have with me today Robert Van Der Eiken. He's the head of school for Academia Cotopaxi in Quito, Ecuador. And uh, we're going to spend a few minutes learning about his school's response during this global pandemic. Robert, thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Robert, let's start with just an overview of the school. What kind of students and families do you serve? What's your dominant learning model? And we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, we're uh, approximately 630 students last year. We're going to see what happens this year, of which about 50% are, are expats. And then um, this school has taken on, on uh, the challenge and the opportunities of inclusion much more than a lot of other international schools. So we have a wide range of learner needs. Approximately 15% of our students have special needs, ranging from profound autism, uh, cerebral palsy, learning various different kinds of learning challenges. Uh, and so that's added another dynamic now to this because we have some students, if we return to school, who are more susceptible physically to getting ill. And we're IB, sorry, PYP and IB school. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Thanks. So tell us a little bit about what it was like to transition to remote learning uh, this past March. Well, the first thing is, is that I have always had this kind of dark fascination with viruses myself. I, I studied them in university. I studied geography and I, my major research was on the, the, the fusion of AIDS back in the 80s, which was phenomenal to learn how that had spread. And so from in, in December, I started actually following this. Also, I used to work in China, so I have friends there and I could see what was happening. And I actually said to our, our senior leadership team in a meeting, I said, we have maximum 10 days, they're gonna shut down the schools. And they're like, really? I said, no, it's gonna happen. See what's happening in other countries. I said, let's please get this, the teachers practicing various forms of online learning in the classes now with the children and with the students at the different levels so that the kids already have an idea. And exactly nine days later, the government said, boom. And we were fortunate enough that because we had already started that, the next day we, would, we turned it on where other schools had to wait till the following week to get their online learning going. Not saying it's perfect by any means. There's a lot of need for improvement. I don't think we're really doing online learning. I think we're doing emergency distance learning but we were a little bit a couple steps ahead which was good i wish we had done a little bit even more so in hindsight yeah absolutely so um tell us a little bit about um what kind of learning and teaching you're seeing happening during emergency distance learning well it really it very i can imagine other uh, schools are experiencing the same thing there's a it's a huge variance between you know, a, a 12th grader, 11th grader who's self-motivated and getting ready for university and a kindergarten student. And we actually start our program at one years of age. Our younger students, we have a, a preschool program called Imagine. And so the younger the children are, I'd say from second grade down, the challenge has become much more so um, with respect to the parents being engaged in the learning, and some of them feel very taxed during very difficult, stressful time. We used um, a seesaw platform in the younger, up, up until fifth grade, and then it was Google Classrooms beyond that. We're reevaluating. We think that maybe the upper elementary probably would benefit more from working more like middle school. Uh, they're a little bit more independent. We are uh, a BYOD device uh, school. So there's children from third grade on are working with tablets and with computers already. So um, that's, that has helped. But it's, it's, been, it's been hit and miss. Some teachers really get it. And what we're doing right now is encouraging a lot of teachers to take, there's a lot of programs right now, PD going online. And I've basically, I, I think it's the future at least in the short term, that we're going to be all more online teachers. And I think we're also going to be more generalists and that teachers have to realize that they're no longer a, a grade nine math teacher. They're, they're, they're teaching 15 year olds and 14 year olds. Yeah, absolutely. So Robert, I'd like to ask you about a couple sort of student subpopulations that you mentioned here, which I think we haven't discussed much on the podcast. 
So let's start with your early learners because you're way before kindergarten and you're serving mm -hmm. and families. So what seems to have worked really well for you all with your very youngest kids, say six and under? Yeah, the, well, with the really young ones in the preschool program, what we did was we offered three options because preschools are being hit, I think, everywhere. I just was reading that one big school in, in Argentina just closed, uh, 500 students. Um, that we offered three options. So families could decide if they want to have one day of engagement online with support for the fam for the parents, three days or five days. And the idea there was that a lot of families are really evaluating the value of private preschool programs and paying for it. Uh, they're giving them that option so that we still kept them within the fold of our community. And, and we saw some of them decide initially with one day a week, and then they liked it, so they ticked up to three days. And we're kind of going to probably follow that model going forward with the youngest students. It's, it's giving them flexibility. And more of, the, more of the work is actually with the parents than it is with the student, obviously. When they're three years old, uh, it's really the parent that we're coaching through the learning. Yeah, so what does a day of engagement look like for a three-year-old? Uh, boy, it's, uh, it's, I've been, I've been in a, a couple Zoom classes with uh, rhythm and movement type things and, and participating with them. Uh, I think the most successful ones is the ones where you see the parents are on the, on the side, engaged with them. I think the challenge that we're, we're all facing in schools is that a lot of parents, they equate school as being a six or eight hour day. Right. They don't realize that you know, if you walk around a typical school as a principal or as a, an administrator, I would say three to four hours of the typical school day is actual engaged learning. Right. The rest are transitions and lunch and social time and getting your backpacks and all those things that happen within that. And there's a lot of learning that takes place. We've removed all that. Mm -hmm. And now we're only focused on the learning. So the parents, whether it's the, the three-year-old or the 13-year-old, they're saying, my child's only engaged for three hours. And they're expecting the teacher to be doing what we're doing right now on Zoom, which is just, it's untenable. It's, I think we're all Zoomed to death, yeah, yeah. but especially if you have 15 kids and you're trying to keep them on, on task. So we have to get more to providing asynchronous, I think, uh, opportunities. And then when we get together, it's a celebration of what we've learned during the last three days. Okay, I want you to look at all this stuff, read this, do this, talk to your parents, and I'll see you on Thursday. And we're going to do this, we'll follow up on it. Yeah, that was really nicely said. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about students with special needs. I think unlike a lot of international schools, you have a pretty significant population, as you mentioned, which probably mirrors uh, many U.S. schools, for example. Yes. Um, so, and I've, and I've heard that a lot of school leaders and school systems are really struggling with that student population. So what seems to have worked well for you in that regard and where do the challenges still seem to be? Yeah, we're, we're like I said, we have about 15%, which is U.S. recommended average of special needs, which is high for an international school. Um, but uh, having counselors and having learning support teachers uh, assigned to those students individually has helped a lot. There's some students who really just, they're not able to, to do this. And that's the biggest challenge we're having right now. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think that that's, the, it's just the one-on-one -on -one contact and follow-up. Uh, well, I think where the biggest challenge is going to be with respect to those students is if we win we open and it's going to be in a blended model and we have to do social distancing and small groups pods. That's kind of the model that I think a lot of us are looking at is those specialist teachers, they would be exposed to a lot of students and a lot of classrooms, which would just mitigate all the efforts to socially isolate people. Uh, and so kind of like the, the debate about do we, continue that integration where they're included in a regular classroom or do we move those special learning support students apart and dedicate a teacher who can support them which is not inclusive but there's a time when maybe health is more important than uh, other ideals that we, we would like to follow yeah fair enough 
Um, so if you think about sort of the last few months, what seem to be some decisions that your leadership team has made that seem to have worked pretty well for you all? I mean, besides having a virologist as the head of school. <laughs> yeah, well I, well, I guess one thing that right from the beginning, the very first weekend, uh, you know, it was ultimately, I guess it was my call, but we all supported it. We had uh, several staff and it, and it crept throughout the rest of the year, but we were the first school, I think, in the region where we just said, if you feel safer, go home. It, and, and so we had uh, people the very first weekend, school closed on Thursday, that, that weekend we had a few people already fly back to the States. Ironically, now it seems like it might be safer here. But uh, I just, when I had those, those people, out, they called me up, I said, listen, I'm not in a position and none of us are in a position for you to choose uh, your job over your health and your mental well-being. And the thing is, is that I would be in classes like this and the one teacher was a kilometer away from me and the other one was in Colorado. And they're giving the classes to the same kids. And so it's really shrunk the world. And I think that that was... Uh, a, a very good decision on our part. Other schools were making people stay. Other people were penalizing. Uh, other schools were penalizing people for for leaving. And we just said, if you feel better, go. But we want you to continue teaching. And everybody followed through, a hundred percent. So taking care of your people has really worked for you. So as you move along into the fall, what do you think that's going to look like? What kind of considerations are you all thinking about in terms of next season? Yeah, I mean, we started with three scenarios. Mm -hmm. You know, one is like, we're gonna open up. The other one is that we're gonna be blended. The other one's gonna be, we're online. And I all along said, I think that the only real scenario is that's gonna be blended moving forward or, or some kind of uh, hybrid model. Because even if we open up, we're gonna have a lot of students, parents. I know, cause I've called, I've given my personal phone number to every family and spoken to a lot. They're going through a lot of difficult times financially. They need reassurances. And there are families who say, I don't, want to, I don't want my child to go back. I had a conversation with one parent who's a doctor, works in the hospitals and she's got a, an older student. She said, I'm not sending my kid back to school. You have no idea how bad this can be cause you haven't seen it. And so I think that we're gonna to have to give that option to families. And we're gonna see a lot fewer students on campus for various reasons, whether they've withdrawn or whether they, the parents are pulling them out or because they have to, because there's been an outbreak or there's not someone in their family's ill. And what we will have is, uh, we're fortunate we have a fairly large campus for our student body. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully we, can, we don't have to go with an A day, B day split schedule and stuff, but that we can socially isolate with the number of students. I'm now thinking maybe, assigning each family a color like mm -hmm. five colors and just saying if we get to the point where our classes are a little bit bigger than we want that one day of the week mm -hmm. the, the blues don't come to school right and then we still would have 80 percent of our students on campus the teachers could teach normally and the, and it would be just a like a social agreement we we just have to lower the numbers but that's better than having alternate days or A days, B days or afternoon classes, which will be a real nightmare for the families. Yeah, Robert, one of the things that I'm hearing a lot of people talk about is sort of these staggered schedules or split schedules where some students are in school and some are at home, like you said, with your color scheme, right? Does that make double work for the teachers where now they're having to design for both face-to-face -face and online, whereas in the past, they were designing for face-to-face -face, and then they designed wholly online, but now we're asking for both. Yeah, yeah, and we have to allocate, I think, all schools more resources to the teachers because especially with the younger ones, you've got 10 kids in a classroom, you're with them all day, you have to, you have to supervise them on the playground, et cetera, in ways that you maybe didn't have to before. Meanwhile, you still have 12, you know, six kids who are at home. Right. And that's going to be a challenge, uh, but I think it's the reality that we're going to have to support. We're, we're going to allocate some human resources, mm -hmm. people to support the teachers, and also we're looking at more um, like technological infrastructure to streamline it for the for the teachers. But I think that if we do it where we, if we get the numbers or for us that are too big to carry in one day, that if we just say, okay, we have to reduce two students. We only have two students who are out. 
Okay. And that would be just like a normal day. We just say, listen, you know, it's Monday. Remember, Johnny and Mary can't come to school on Mondays. Instead of having, if you have where you have A day, half the class, and B day, half the class, you're doubling the work and right. having the, the, the exposure to the class. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Robert, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you for our conversation today. Is there anything else you want to share here at the end of all this? Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of conversations and I, I remember I was with my IT director and we were in one and we walked away from it. It was a, a Zoom with directors and IT people around the world. And I said, you know, the thing that surprises me the most is that the writing was on the wall. The writing has been on the wall for a long time, not only with respect to viruses, but also our need to change the, our approach to teaching. Right. You know, I, I, I remember doing a workshop years ago on 20th century teaching, 21st century teaching. And I went into a school and I was in a classroom and I said, you know what? I look around this classroom and other than a couple of laptops or desktops maybe at the time yeah. in the corner, it looks exactly like my third grade classroom. Yeah. And it looks exactly like my mother's third grade classroom. Yeah. And now with this opportunity, we realize that schedules and calendars and things can be very, very different. And, and there are students who are actually thriving. We have some students who are doing better through this. Yeah. They, they prefer this. They prefer the flexibility. I think most of them prefer, especially the, mid, the middle school and high school kids, is like me waking up and just saying, okay, I'll comb my hair and I'll go to class. I don't have to go through the whole routine. Yeah. So, yeah. I wow. think that there's an opportunity here. I think we have to look at the opportunity and, and also just be very patient and always put safety first. Heaven forbid that it, we, you know, we get anybody in our communities sick. Yeah, absolutely. Robert, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you with planning for next year. Thank you. You too. Have a good day. Bye bye.